Probably you've heard the familiar old saying, aim at nothing and you'll hit it every time. So often the very reason that we do not grow spiritually is that we want, we always say we want to grow, but we don't aim to grow. So we drift from day to day and year to year without experiencing significant growth in the Lord. And we are all spiritually struck. If you're struck spiritually, God wants you to grow. Even if you've been a Christian for so many years already, make this year 2018 a year of growth in godliness. Until you're perfectly like Jesus Christ, which won't happen until you see him face to face, there is a room to grow. So in our text this morning, Peter here has a wise counsel on how we can grow in godliness and the motivation to do those things. But you won't grow without diligence, deliberate discipline, and effort. But before we continue, let's commit this time to the Lord. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful morning and thank you again for uh, bringing us here to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we thank you. This is your word. And because it is your word, because it is God breathed, help us to take it for what it is, the very words of God. And Lord, we know that your word is powerful, effective, and sharper than any two-edged sword. And you have given this to us to correct, rebuke, uh, instruct, and train us up for righteousness. And therefore, Lord, we ask that we will be not only hearers, but we will respond to these words in faith and be doers of the word of God. Empower me. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in verses 1 to 4, Peter sets before us the resources that God has graciously given to all of us when we accepted him as Lord and Savior. He has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through knowing Christ and his gracious promises to us. In our text, we have divided that into two principles or two truths. The responsibility to grow in Christ-likeness that we see in verses 5 to 7. You see, Peter, I won't read the verses anymore. Peter begins, now for this very reason also. Now for this very reason also. What is he referring to? This takes us back to verse 3, where Peter told us that when, again, when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, God has granted to us, to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Allow me to read verse 3 to you. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. The life there refers to eternal life. The Bible teaches us that all of us are dead in sin. So what does man need when he's dead? Does he need a moral code to live by? Does he need helpful tips on how to be healthy and how to have a happy life? No, he needs life. And God imparts life, eternal life. To those who will receive him as a free gift. As a free gift, brothers and sisters in Christ. But this eternal life does not pertain only to heaven. Rather, it means that from the time you have received Jesus Christ, it continues throughout eternity. It continues throughout eternity. So eternal life impacts the most practical way, in a most practical way, how we live daily life. Here and now. Peter is asserting. Listen. Peter is asserting that God has granted to us everything. You see? Everything on how to deal with life's problems. Minor and major. His word tells us how to manage sufferings. How to deal with tragedies, with death. Even whether it's our own or the death of loved ones. His word tells us how to work through relational difficulties. His word tells us how to gain wisdom in our everyday situation. His word tells us how to manage our finances. His word instructs us 
on how to handle, to control our emotions. For thousands of years, the Bible has been able to equip every saint to go through unspeakable tragedies, uh, persecutions, even martyrdom. Our problem today is not that the Bible is not capable of dealing with our problems. The problem is that we don't know the vast resources that God has put in the Bible for us. I hope that you will have time to read Our Sufficiency in Christ by John MacArthur. He says, to seek something more than what we have been given in Christ is like frantically knock, knocking on a door, seeking what is inside, not realizing you already hold the key in your pocket. You see? God has granted to you everything pertaining to life. Not only life, but also godliness. Godliness is inextricably bound up with eternal life. If you possess eternal life in Christ, you will be growing in godliness or Christ-likeness. The faith, the saving faith that God has given you is a faith that works, is a faith that transforms you. We will never attain perfection in this life, but we should see evident growth to obedience to the Word of God, which are summed up in the two greatest commandments, love God and people. Do you ever wonder why people don't just flock to Christ by the millions or by the thousands? He's offering complete forgiveness of sins and eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. Why aren't people lined up in churches, in the doors of churches all over the world and asking, what must I do to be saved? The answer in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Using another analogy, we are all dead in sin. Now, if you have put your trust in Jesus Christ, it is not because of your keen insight. It is not because of your brilliant powers of logic. It is because God has mercifully opened your blind eyes to see the truth. You see, we come to know Christ when he opens our eyes so that we will see his glory and excellence at the cross. At that point, we begin a lifelong quest of knowing Him more deeply in our lives. And that growing personal knowledge of Christ as our all in all supplies everything that we need in life and godliness. Did you see that? The growing personal knowledge of Christ as our all in all, He is sufficient then He supplies everything that we need in life and godliness. And so Peter says, now for this very reason also, he's saying, grow in your faith. And to be Christ-like, to grow in Christ-likeness, the first thing that you have to be assured of is that you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and put your trust in His gracious, in His uh, precious, magnificent promises. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the point is that you cannot begin to grow spiritually until you have received the new life in God because the life of Christ in you is the one that motivates, is the one that changes, is the one that helps you grow spiritually. The instant you put your trust in God, listen, the instant you put your trust in God, God graciously gives the key to the unfathomable riches of Christ. Ang di malirip na kayamanan ni Cristo, ibinigay ng Diyos ang susi upang magkaroon tayo ng access sa di malirip na kayamanan ni Cristo which will supply everything that you need for life and godliness. Do you get that? 
And also, when you want to grow in Christ-likeness, you have to have the right motivation. It is essential. Right motivation in Christian life is essential. It is easy, brothers and sisters in Christ, to have the wrong motivation. Maybe, for example, Lord, I want to grow in Christ-likeness so that people would think, wow, ang galing. Grabe pa lang kanyang pananampalataya. Lodi, pet malu. But that is pride. That is wrong motivation. Or perhaps, Lord, I want to grow in Christ-likeness so that I'll be successful in life, in career, in my job, in my business. Well, that may be better than pride, but it is still wrongly focused because it is focused on man. It is focused on self. Mali. Uh, uh, pa Pastor, ibig sabihin ba, maling mag-desire? I'm not saying that it is wrong to desire God's blessing on your life, on your family, on your job, on your career, on your business. But the motivation behind that desire should be, Lord, I want your blessing so that my life will bring glory to your wonderful name. So that my family, my business, my career, my job will bring honor to your name. And you set your love for me and you have saved me while I am still at the gutter of sin. You called me out of the darkness into your marvelous light. And so, Lord, I want to grow in Christ-likeness so that I will know more of you deeply and so that my, my, my life will bring glory and proclaim your excellencies. That is the very reason. That's why we want to grow in Christ-likeness, to know Him more deeply and to bring glory to His name. In other words, God's grace. It is God's grace that motivates us to grow spiritually. And then he says, now for this very reason, also applying all diligence. The phrase applying all diligence, the word applying occurs only here in the New Testament and means to bring in besides. The idea is God has given us, given you his life and all of his promises. Now you bring in diligence so that you may grow. To grow in Christ-likeness, Peter is saying to all of us, apply all diligence. Now, diligence sometimes has the meaning of haste or speed, but here it means eagerness, earnestness, or zeal. So Peter is saying, make every effort to add the qualities that we're going to discuss in a while. The word supply is an interesting Greek word from which we get our words chorus and choreography. It refers to a wealthy man who will give everything necessary to put on a stage play or a musical performance. It means to give lavishly because such donors do not want people thinking that they had been stingy in supplying the chorus. So here is what Peter is saying when he says, Apply all diligently. Make every effort eagerly or lavishly to supply the qualities on the foundation of your faith in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is very important for us to see. Perhaps you've heard the teaching or perhaps in a church or you grew up in a church that says we don't have to exert effort or work hard to grow spiritually. May I repeat that? There are some who teach that we don't have to exert effort or grow or work hard to grow spiritually. And they say if you're striving, if you're exerting yourself, you're not resting on Christ. Just rest in Christ and He will give you victory over sins and He will produce holiness in your life. And they say that the analogy, they appeal to the analogy of the vine and the branches. You see, the branch doesn't struggle to bear fruit, they say. Rather, it effortlessly abides in the vine and the life of the vine flows through the branch resulting in fruit. Parang andali pag-isipin, di po ba? 
But that, ulitin ko to, that approach to the Christian life disregard other scriptures that talk about our struggle and effort. Do you see? Yung sinasabi nila, you, don't, you just have to rest in Christ, you don't have to work hard. But that is in contradiction na sinasabi ng mga ibang scriptures. Allow me to let us consider some verses. A result of uh, God's grace, Paul, work hard. In 1 Corinthians 15.10, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace toward me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I but the grace of God with me. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 29, Paul again says, For the purpose also I labor, striving according to His power which mightily works within me. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4, it talks about our striving against sin. And in many places in the New Testament, he uses the picture, the Christian life, in a warfare, in a battle. Fighting is not effortless. And you must exert your exelf, yourself to the point of exhaustion. Pastor, you know, I have this, this addiction. I can't really overcome it. I pray naman. But do you pray until the point of exhaustion? Do you get what Peter is telling us? Growing in Christ likeness requires some diligence and hard work. Keeping in mind the glorious truth that God has imparted new life to you in Christ and that He has given you those precious and magnificent promises to equip you for life and godliness. And what does this growth entail? Where should we focus? That we see in verses uh, 5b to 7. Okay? Faith there is the foundation that we must apply moral excellence, knowledge, self control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. Now, the list is not exhaustive, but it is illustrative and suggestive for starters, for new believers, and easy remembrance. Now, he chose these qualities because they characterize the opposite, the evil characteristics of the false teachers that Peter will expose in chapter 2. They don't have moral excellence, those uh, false teachers. They are not Christ-like. Uh, they didn't have Knowledge, what they say, they have secret knowledge, but they didn't know God who is holy. They were not, they don't have, they didn't have self-control because they indulge in the flesh. They don't persevere. They are not godly. And they use people to exploit. So where is brotherly kindness to exploit these people? Where is brotherly kindness and love? Brothers and sisters in Christ, in the list that Peter gives us, there seems to be a flow of thought. Allow me to share. When one, faith is the bedrock foundation. Without faith, we are not Christians. And we, in faith, we have to supply moral excellence. It refers to the moral perfections of Jesus. We are to grow in the character qualities that mark the Lord Jesus Christ. It is necessary next to faith. Why? Because without that, we can have a clear conscience. What do I mean? If we live in known disobedience to God, if we live in known disobedience to God, if we are living in sin, God will not reveal His truth, spiritual truth, to us. So virtue precedes knowledge. Knowledge refers to practical wisdom that is gained in the exercise of moral excellence. We gain the knowledge of how God wants us to live daily life. It follows moral excellence because we must know the Word of God to inform our conscience. 
and guide our thinking and behavior. You see, our conscience is our guide, but it will be a faulty guide if it is not saturated with the Word of God. And then, knowing the truth does not help, help if we don't exercise self-control to practice the truth. So self-control is next. Self-control means that you must go against your impulses or feelings in order to attain a higher goal. It applies to controlling all desires, including greed, sex, food, emotions, and the use of our time. Listen, the presence or absence of self-control is one of the most determinative factors in whether you will go or your spiritual life will be good or you will have problems in your spiritual life. Did you get that? The presence or absence of self-control is one of the most determinative factors in whether you will do well in your Christian life or you will have problems in your Christian life, especially in 2018. Because it affects how you manage your time, how to manage your money. It affects your ability to control, to, to overcome temptations. It affects how you develop those character qualities, controlling your tongue, controlling your anger, controlling your temper. It regulates your health through proper diet, exercise, and rest. And most of all, self-control is very important because whether or not, no, it will tell you whether or not you will spend consistent time in word and in prayer in 2018. If there is one quality here that we are to develop, I pray that we will include self-control. Why? Because we are easily drawn to quick fix for the problems that require sustained discipline. Pagkailangan ng disiplina, habit na gagawin natin, ayaw natin, gusto natin quick fix. Kaya kung gusto natin magpapayat, isang, gahanap tayo ng pill na isang inom para lumit yung chan ni pastor. It requires a lifetime habit of discipline. Brothers and sisters, control your life under the control of the Holy Spirit. But self-control on a few occasions, again, no, as I've said, will not help. If we yield, it will ruin our testimony. So we need perseverance when trials and temptations come. Perseverance refers to the ability to endure hardship and distress. It refers to the characteristic of a man who is unswerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings. It is often used in reference to suffering. It means that we keep following Christ even when it results in persecution or hardship. Did you get that last line? It means... That we keep following Christ, even when it results to persecution or hardship. As we persevere, we will develop godliness. Godliness refers to living in reverence to God in every situation. It refers to awe in the presence of God and the obedience that befits that reverence. But true godliness is not just a private matter between the individual and God. It manifests itself in godly relationships. That's why we need brotherly kindness. This is the Greek word Philadelphia, which means brotherly love. It is the feeling of kindness or mutual understanding and care that should exist among family members. We also need self-sacrificing love. This is the Greek agape, which is a self-sacrificing commitment to seek the highest good of the one love. Now, since Peter exhorts us to apply all diligence to supply brotherly kindness and love, therefore these qualities are not spontaneous. We must work at them. And sometimes we must often sacrifice our feelings of laziness, of, of pride, of self-righteousness to demonstrate love to others. As a reminder, those qualities are not 
in chronological order. They are in a logical order. It means that it is wrong for us to think that we have to perfect virtue before we go on to self uh, to knowledge or we have to have vast amounts of knowledge before we can develop self-control. No, they are interrelated as in the manner that as I have mentioned to you. Now, why would anyone want to spend significant time and effort in 2018 to read and study the Word of God? Why would you expand? Why would the leadership ask you to perhaps set uh, your alarm early enough so that you'll get out of bed and have fellowship with God early in the morning? Why would you say no to temptation when yielding would seem to be more appealing and it would make you feel good? Why do you have to practice love, patience, kindness, self-sacrificing love, being good to others when they seem not to appreciate your efforts? What is the motivation for us to grow in Christ-likeness? What motivation is there to be diligent to grow in Christ-likeness? What is there for us? Perhaps, nang tinatanong ko po ito sa inyo, perhaps you're thinking, eh di po ba, Pastor, yun lang naman dapat ang gawin kasi yun ang tama. Ba't kailangan pa kaming sabihan ng motivation ni Peter? You know, the Lord Jesus Christ, or Peter, Asked the same question. He asked the same question. And the Lord Jesus Christ did not rebuke him. In Matthew 19, 27, Peter said, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? And the reply of the Lord Jesus Christ is this. Truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or farms, for my name's sake, will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. Jesus was saying the eternal benefits should motivate us to endure hardships in following the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here in verses 8 to 11, Peter is telling us, showing us the benefits, showing us the results of growing in Christ-likeness. The first, it results in fruitfulness. The qualities there refer to the seven qualities that we have just discussed. And Peter explains why we should apply all diligence to these qualities. Now, Peter states his point in verse 8 in the negative. Because he calls our attention that if we don't grow in godliness, if you claim that you have received Christ as Lord and Savior, and you're not growing spiritually, you will live a useless and fruitful life. Nobody in his right mind would say, pagpasok ng 2018, I would like to waste my life. And this is my mission statement. I will be addicted to alcohol, to drugs, and to gambling. I will spend five hours a day so that's 35 hours a week playing Dota. I plan to spend more than what I earn para mabaaw na ko sa utang sa credit card. No one plans to be useless and unfruitful. Bakit maraming tao end up that way? Bakit? And to put that positively, siguro the question is, how can I be useful? and fruitful in my Christian life? How can I use my time, my talents, my treasures, my temple that God has entrusted to me so that when that day comes, I will hear those precious, precious words, well done, good and faithful servant. Mga kapatid, it's easy to be busy in the Lord's work, but our goal should not just be busy, but we are to be useful and fruitful 
to him. Pastor Luis, the late Pastor Luis Pantoja Jr. was an amazing man of the faith. He has encouraged a lot of people to be in the pastorate, in the pastoral ministry. And God has used him as one of those people who encouraged me to enter seminary and to be in the ministry. I remember in my first year in the pastorate, he would call me. He would visit me at GCF South Metro. There was mentoring time with him. Now, you see, in one of the Gideon's international conventions that I attended, I was still a businessman at that time. I had a chance to talk to him. Honestly, since I didn't grow up as a CB or a conservative Baptist, or a, I didn't go to a conservative Baptist church, I don't know him. I haven't heard his name. But in that four-hour talk with the late Pastor Luis Jr., I was so impressed. He had great theological knowledge. And I said, Lord, please make me like that man. Give me, Lord, that knowledge. Give me wisdom so I can impact a lot of lives. When I came here in December 1, 2014, one of my prayers, you, the kind of prayer na more than you have imagined or uh, more than you have asked or asked for in the prayers. I said, Lord, use me at GCFNE like Pantoja Jr. to impact the lives of people there. Now, while doing my quiet time, one morning, several days or le less than a week when I prayed that prayer, a question popped up in my mind, and I believe that this was an impression from the Lord. The question was, who do you want to be? Luis Sr. or Luis Jr.? I stopped with what I was doing so I could ponder upon that question, the implications of that question. You see, Pastor Luis Sr., the father, was a faithful pastor in Laguna. Right, Pastor Rene? And he had led also a lot of people. You know, he had five sons. All of them became pastors. He and thousands of others like him were godly and faithful servants of the Lord. It is as if the Lord was saying to me, you focus on being faithful and godly as Luis Senior and leave it to me whether I will use you as influential as I will use you or you'll become as influential as Luis Jr. Peter is telling us, focus on growing in Christ-likeness and you will be fruitful in your spiritual life. So what does this fruit look like? Good fruit is seen in a change in our disposition, attitudes, affections, and actions. The scenes, mga kasalanan natin that we formerly love become kadiri to us. We hate those sins already. We begin to love others with the love of Christ. We more easily forgive. And as we are given opportunity, we seek to do good to everyone. We exercise our spiritual gifts for the building up of the body of Christ. We share the good news of salvation and make disciples. We are always grateful and praiseful to God. We seek to do all things for His glory. We confess our sins and pray that He'll continue to work in our lives. And we strive to know God and seek to do the things that please Him. <coughs> because we know that we can't bear true fruit apart from Him. Those are the fruits. If you're not living with a view to how God can use you, to bear fruit for his kingdom, then you're wasting your life. If you're just here every Sunday and you're not serving him, you are also wasting your life. This doesn't mean that you must go to full-time ministry. Rather, it means, brothers and sisters in Christ, that in whatever situation you are with, whether at home, in school, in church, at work, you have the mindset, Lord, Make me useful and fruitful in this place. Let's get rid of the notion 
that we are free to volunteer here in this church if we have time. Maglilingkod ka lang pag mayroong kang oras. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we are bought with the price. We have been redeemed. We are slaves, not volunteers. Can volunteers, can slaves volunteer? Makakapili ba yung mga slaves? No. You know, let's get rid of that notion. It's not biblical. And it's my prayer in 2018, I hope, that this will be one of the things that we are going to do in our lives. Lord, use me. Give me a useful and fruitful life in 2018. I am a slave of you. But it is crucial to realize that being fruitful is not something that is accomplished by mere human willpower, but only by the power of God and His Holy Spirit working in and through the believer in Christ. Being fruitful is a work of God's grace. And then in verse 9, he says, For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Now, Peter wasn't talking about unbelievers. He was talking about those who were in the church, who were truly purified of their sins. But now they were drifting. In our lingo, they were backsliding. So I want you to notice that Peter also shifts from you to he. So as not to directly accuse majority of his readers. But if this is for some, then they should take heed. Blind and short-sighted, they are somewhat synonymously, used synonymously. The literal translation is, they are blind being short-sighted. You see, these people were so focused on their present circumstances that they were not growing in the qualities mentioned in verses 5 to 7. They become virtually blind. To what Christ had done for them in cleansing them from their sins. This forgetful and willful blindness due to their temporal reasons quenched their motivation to be diligent to grow in godliness. The very reason, brothers and sisters in Christ, I hope that you'll see the grace of God in how, on how He has worked in your life so that you can serve Him. But growth in godliness, he requires hard work and discipline over the long haul. What motivates you to keep at it? Remember what Christ did for you. He shed his blood there on the cross to purify you from your sins. So that when you die, you'll be with him. And not only that, he has granted to you everything pertaining to life. Remembering God's grace that he has shown on the cross will motivate you to apply all these things. To apply diligence to all these things so that you'll grow in godliness. Without keeping the cross in view, your life will drift in an ungodly living. And you will waste your life in the light of eternity. The result also is perseverance in the faith. You see, there are a lot of mistaken notions about the assurance of salvation in our day. And most evangelicals, sadly, believe that when they have prayed the sinner's prayer, when they have received Christ as their Lord and Savior, that will save them. That is safe. They are already safe eternally. And that they shouldn't doubt on that fact. But they overlook the clear scriptural thing, uh, truth that new life in Christ always manifests itself in the fruit of of godliness because again the faith the saving faith that god has given you is a faith that works it is a faith that transforms it is a faith that changes you so that you'll grow in holiness and sin less and less and less and here in verse 10 you will see peter brings together two important points that we often separate the sovereignty of god in choosing and calling us and the responsibility to be diligent to grow in godliness so that we grow in assurance about God's choosing and calling us. How then do we gain the assurance that God has called us and chosen us? First, have you heard the call to repent of your sins and believe in Christ? And did you obey that call? We must remember, bulag po tayo, veiled, tayo po'y patay. Now God has removed that veil. God has quickened your life. And then the Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin so that you will know that you are a sinner and then you will repent. 
na ginawa po ba natin na yun na nag-obey tayo? And then, second, how do you know that your repentance and faith were genuine? God changed your heart so that now you desire to grow in godliness so that you will grow to know Him better. You desire to please and obey the Lord who gave Himself on the cross to rescue you from God's wrath, from God's judgment. In 1 John 2, 3, by this we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments and you take none of the credit for your salvation and you realize that it is only the sovereign grace of God that He has chosen you and He has called you while you were still in your sins. And then He says, for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. These things again refer back to verses 5 and 7. But does Peter, ibig sabihin po ba ni Peter na kapag diligent na pinapractice niyo itong mga qualities na ito, hindi ka na magkakasala? That is unrealistic because 1 John 1.8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Kapag sinasabi mo hindi ka na nagkakasala, ang truth ay wala sa'yo. But that is in the context Nung sinabi po ni Peter yon, in the context of those false teachers who have turned their backs, their faith on God. Ang ibig sabihin po mga kapatid ni Peter, if you are diligent to grow in godliness, it affirms your calling and your being chosen. And you will not turn away from him and commit apostasy like those uh, false teachers that he will mention in chapter 2. And lastly, eternal blessings. Peter means that if we are diligent to grow in godliness, God will welcome us into our eternal dwelling in heaven. And this is the truth that Aunt Kaina, Brother Sunny are holding on to. That when, they, when God called them here, God will welcome them in that eternal kingdom, to be with Him forever. Brothers and sisters in Christ, spiritual growth is a long process. It's not a quick fix. It's like a diet or exercise program. It only shows results when you do it consistently. And you're stuck with it over time. If you're not making any progress in your spiritual life, then you are not well established. And it is my prayer and my hope that this 2018, you will aim to grow spiritually and develop, add to your faith, moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, godly perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. Why? Because in the present, growing in godliness will give us the joy of being fruitful and useful to the Lord so that we won't waste our time, our, our lives. And it will keep us from stumbling and falling away from the Lord. And in the future, the Lord will welcome us into His eternal kingdom where we will be with Him. We will dwell with Him in indescribable blessedness forever. Brothers and sisters in Christ, may the challenge be accepted by everyone that we will grow in Christ-likeness next year. Lord, thank you for your word. And it is, Lord, our prayer. Help us, O oh God, to add in our faith, richly supply, Lord, the qualities that we have just discussed. And I pray, Panginoon, that 2018 will be a useful, fruitful year. Thank you. This is our prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.